welcome, welcome to the Equal Opportunities Committee. It's the third meeting of 2016. Can I ask you to set any electronic devices to flight mode or switch off, please? We will come to the usual introductions in a moment after the first agenda item, which is the decision on taking business in private. You are asked to agree a paper on your review of the budget considerations at agenda item three in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Agenda item two is an evidence session on the Scottish Transgender Alliance Equal Recognition Campaign. We will start the session with some introductions. At the table, we have our clerking and research team, official reporters and broadcasting services, and around the room, we are also supported by the security. And also welcome to the observers in the public gallery. My name is Margaret McCulloch, and I am the, the committee's convener. And I now invite members and witnesses to introduce themselves in turn, starting here on my right. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, Sandra White, MSP for Glasgow Kelvin, Deputy Convener. Hey, I'm John Mason, a MSP for Glasgow Shettleston. Good morning, Christian Allard, MSP for North East Scotland. Martin Vag, good morning, John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. Good morning, Annabel Gould, the MSP West of Scotland. Good morning, my name is Vic Valentine. I'm the policy officer at the STA. Um, just to let everyone know that I use gender neutral they pronouns. Hello, my name is James Morton. I'm the manager of the Scottish Transgender Alliance. My name is Alison Ewing, and I'm the founder of a parent support group called Transparencies, which supports parents of trans children. And we have a branch in Glasgow and one in just started up in Edinburgh. Okay, thank you. Can I ask the witnesses if they would like to make any brief opening statements? Dave, thank you very much for hearing this evidence session about the Equal Recognition Campaign. Um, it's a campaign that is asking for legislative change by the Scottish Parliament um, on reform for the Gender Recognition Act. Um, we're calling for three things in particular. We're calling for the Scottish Government to remove the psychiatric diagnosis requirement from legal gender recognition. We're calling for the Scottish Government to reduce the age at which people can get legal recognition of the gender they live as. And we're calling for the Scottish Government to provide legal recognition for people who do not identify as men or women. And we're happy to elaborate on those in, in, in regards to questions. Thanks. OK, thank you very much. Anyone else make, like to make a comment? No? Happy with that? OK. Can I ask you um, <coughs> about the current process of gender recognition, where you actually are with it just now, please? OK. At the moment, um, since 2004, the Gender Recognition Act has provided a mechanism for transsexual people to change their gender on their birth certificates and therefore their legal gender from male to female or from female to male. It requires you to be over 18. It requires you to provide a whole load of different documents to prove that you've been living in that new gender for over two years. So bank statements, um, passport, um, rent sort of statements, um, bills, um, all kinds of things, empl employment pay slips. So you have to create a file of, of those. Um, you also need to provide a written report by your GP and a written report by your psychiatrist and there's a list of special t specialists that are allowed to write that psychiatric report and it's very restricted so you've only got around seven um, people in Scotland who are allowed to provide that second report. Those two reports have to detail um, very specifically what what if any medical treatments you've undergone as part of gender reassignment. So you need to provide hormone dosage, um, length of time, medication names, exact details and dates of any surgeries. Um, and it's very easy for doctors to make a slight mistake on those um, or just not give the technical enough details and then the application gets rejected by the panel. Um, it goes to a tribunal panel you don't see them in person, but it's basically judiciary and medical practitioners who look at all your documentation in a, in a very legalistic way. And if there's any I's that aren't dotted or T's that aren't crossed perfectly, then they reject and, and require you to submit further evidence. So people have found it a very traumatic and difficult process, very frustrating and very much feel that it removes their autonomy and their, their, their ability to self-declare and instead places it in the hands of, of a judicial panel and, and, and makes people feel very, uh, very demeaned. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Um, 
I think John Mason would like to pick up on that just now. Okay, uh, thanks, convener. Um, yes, you mentioned psychiatric diagnosis, and I mean, I think, frankly, well, certainly myself, uh, you know, we're not, I'm not very knowledgeable in this whole area, so if you assume that I don't know very much, uh, but can you just maybe explain what's involved in psychiatric uh, diagnosis and y your main reasons for why you feel that should be removed? Okay. In terms of the World Health Organization's international classification of diseases, um, the only thing that's required to receive a diagnosis of gender dysphoria, so, um, transsexualism, is to, for over six months, um, identify strongly with a different gender and wish to, to live in that different gender and potentially have medical interventions to, to assist with that. Um, however, in terms of the psychiatric report that's required by the Gender Recognition Panel, they go much further in their demands of what goes in that. So they expect you to have the psychiatrist detail everything right back to your childhood, um, what your sexual preferences are, what toys you played with as a child. And indeed, if you took the average person and you listed all of those things, I'm not convinced that the average person would get through the Gender Recognition Panel. Um, it's interesting that there's a World Professional Association for Transgender Health, which is um, the body that represents all the different psychiatrists, psychologists and other gender specialists around the world. And they themselves have said that they don't think that psychiatric diagnosis should be a requirement for legal gender recognition. They feel that the medical profession, it should simply be evaluating your readiness for medical treatment, not your access to human rights. So they stated, no particular medical, surgical or mental health treatment or diagnosis is an adequate marker for anyone's gender identity. So those should not be requirements for legal gender change. So that was a quote from the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. And so is, is the UK unusual, would you say, in the spectrum of countries as to how they deal with all this? It's very much... Um, the legislation of different countries very much reflects the year in which it was passed. So what you see is the legislation that was passed back in the 70s often required sterilisation and, and things like that. Um, legislation that was passed in the very early 21st century, such as the UK, doesn't require sterilisation, but does require these intrusive medical reports. And the legislation that's more recently being passed, such as in Ireland uh, last year, it's taking a self-declaration model, and that is now the... the the recognised best practice um, in human rights terms. It's, so it's, legislation has been improving each decade and, and the, UK parla UK, the UK legislation um, is now fallen behind the times and we think it's, it's, it's uh, due for renewal. So you'd basically be arguing for self-declaration, there's no need for anything to replace the uh, psych psychiatric diagnosis? We, we believe that it should be similar to how you would change your gender on other documents at the moment, so you could um, get sort of like your name and your gender marker sort of changed on your medical records um, and on your bank statements and things like that at the moment, simply by doing a statute declaration, saying this is who I am, this is how I intend to live. Um, and, and that would be an oath, the same as, 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 as if you were in a court of law. Um, and we think that that's what should be done for your birth certificates as well. That's how it's done in Ireland right. and in other countries. Yes, Rick. Yeah, just to say that um, in, in Europe, it's the Netherlands, Denmark, Malta, Ireland, Sweden, Norway and Belgium that all use this self-declaration model. And as James said, that most of that legislation has been passed since 2010. So it's not that it would be unusual for Scotland to follow suit in doing that. It, it is sort of what's moving towards being considered the international best practice. Okay, thanks. I, I mean, you said something about six months earlier on. Uh, so, I mean, w would that be relevant here, or has is, is there got to be some kind of waiting period or anything like that? That six months is in regards to access to medical interventions, because people need to to make, be, be very confident that they are making the right decisions for irreversible treatments to their body. Um, but for a document change, um, we don't believe that medical um, diagnosis should be should be part of that. Um, you wouldn't require people to go through sort of any kind of medical evaluation for other types of, of, of uh, documentation change. Okay, thanks. And um, I mean, I, I, I suppose just to, to be kind of devil's advocate, are there any, uh, with self-declaration, are there any drawbacks in that? Are there any unintended consequences or anything like that? Sometimes people are concerned that people might do this for some kind of nefarious purpose or as a joke. There's no evidence that people have been changing their um, 
gender on other types of document that you can currently do through self-declaration as any kind of joke or for any kind of malicious intent. Mm -hmm. So we think that that's highly unlikely to occur. And we think that in terms of access to single-sex services, um, Scottish Women's Aid, Rape Crisis Scotland, the Scottish Prison Service are all voluntarily using a good practice self-declaration model for how they allow access to their single-sex services already. So they're obviously confident that uh, this can be managed appropriately. Okay, that's great. Uh, Thanks so much. San yeah, Sandra and then Annabel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask Alison, is that okay? Yeah, just that's good. I'd like to ask Alison about the involvement of, of, of parents or guardians, etc. When James mentioned the fact that with the psychiatric diagnosis, they asked what toys you played with, etc., etc. Um, how involved do parents or guardians become in that so-called diagnosis? Are you asked about it, or is it simply? Oh, um, when your children are under 16, mm -hmm. then the parent is involved in the assessment process. So we do see a psychiatrist, and they do ask about your child's history, and also encourage the child to um, answer that as well. So you're, you've, you've to give, a, like, if there's been a history of gender dysphoria, if there's been, how did they play with their toys? So, yeah, they do. They ask for that in assessment before just, you can get the diagnosis of gender dysphoria. Yeah, and, and when you come to the situation where there's some children who haven't got a parent and guardian or, you know, a parent who's still living, uh -huh. how, it must be very difficult for them to get that past to go through this psychiatric yeah, I mean, diagnosis. I, I haven't come across any foster carers yet, although mm. I'm a trustee on the board of mermaids as well, and we do have some members who are foster carers, and they have a lot of hoops to get through with social work involvement um, to get adequate treatment for their uh, foster children. Mm -hmm. um, that becomes quite complicated. But yeah. I don't think I know of any foster carers so far in Scotland. These are ones in England, which yeah. have come under the different legislation. I think that, that sort of clarified that point, because it's obviously difficult hoops to go through. Mm -hmm. and that's another I mean, if they're barrier. over 16, then the young people can go and access services themselves, but they will still be asked all the questions, like, what did you play with? Um, what was your favourite colour? Mm. Um, what, how many... Did you play with boys or girls? Things like that. I, I won't comment on that part. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. James, do you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate that um, the process of legal gender change is separate from the access to medical treatments and... Uh, we have our concerns about the questions that are asked in, in terms of readiness for hormone blockers or, or hormones or surgeries for people of different ages, um, but that wouldn't be something that we would be asking the Scottish mm -hmm. Parliament to legislate on. We're, in, in terms of the legislation, we're, we're asking about the Gender Recognition Act, um, which wouldn't affect how the assessments for hormone blockers, hormones or surgeries mm -hmm. took place. Okay. Annabel? Just following on from John Mason's questions, um, James, under the existing law, is there any evidence of anyone who sought gender change under the 2004 Act then wanting to change their status after that? Is there any evidence? You, you mean people reversing their yeah, decision yeah. to transition? That's a very, very tiny minority of people that may decide to, to change back afterwards. Okay. And the tiny number of people that we've encountered, it's virtually always been because of the amount of harassment and um, and and exclusion that they faced once they transitioned. So they ended up feeling like they'd lost so much in being themselves that they felt under pressure to change back in order to regain contact with their family and things like that. Um, so it's it's very, very rare that people change their, 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 their decision. And it's I think it would be increasingly unlikely as society becomes more accepting. Mm -hmm. It's it's that it's that uh, feeling that, that that you just can't take the the, the, the discrimination any longer mm -hmm. that sometimes means no, people it's, go back. That's helpful because if we were to move on to a situation based on self-declaration, um, I simply wondered how we would um, <coughs> how we would manage a situation where someone might subsequently decide <coughs> they had acted in error, made a mistake, or regretted what they'd done. I mean, would the change of law have to allow for that? At at the moment, the gender recognition does already allow you to reapply and change your, okay. your, your gender back should you be in that exceptional circumstance. Mm -hmm. um, just as you can say, the, mar 
the law for marriage recognises that although people have every intention for their marriage to last the rest of their life, in some sad situations it doesn't always. And the number of people who transition back in, in terms of gender recognition is, is minuscule compared mm -hmm. to the number of people who divorce. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Are you finished, John? Yeah. Yep. John Finney? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, as John says, there's a measure of devil's advocacy in a lot of what we are going to ask, because as you'll understand, we need to probe, probe d deeply in, in the, the, these important issues. How much evidence is there that there are people who are ready to apply for gender recognition at the ages of 16 and 17? Um, well, there's, there's now increasing numbers of young people who are finding that their families are supportive and they no longer need to hide their, who they are in shame and fear. Um, so what we find is that um, pre-puberty, um, there's no need for any kind of major interventions or anything like that. Um, and we very much encourage parents to just allow their child to grow and develop and, and allow them to play with whatever toys they want and, and be whoever they want, but not worry about whether this will or will not turn into gender dysphoria and distress at puberty. Um, what the evidence suggests that sort of if somebody is experiencing gender dysphoria and and, and a significant um, difference between their gender identity and their assigned gender at birth when they're hitting puberty and going through puberty, um, then it's highly unlikely that they will then change their mind. And uh, the current uh, NHS treatment in Scotland and indeed throughout Europe um, and the further field is to allow people to have hormone blockers um, if they're entering puberty and that's causing them to feel dis extremely distressed. It gives them some breathing space, time to, to work out how they want to live their life. Um, they're not usually given any, any hormones or anything like that um, until 16, um, but they would usually have all their other documents except their birth certificate changed over. Um, at, at an earlier age and what we what we think is that if their parents are supportive then they should be able to get that birth certificate changed too so that they are not in a situation where they have contradictory elements of, of identity documents some showing one gender some showing another and schools getting confused and, and, and uncertain about what which one they should they should respect and and how to register them for exams and things like that so that just magnifies the, the sense of difference and the, the sense of distress and the sense of, of their identity not being respected um, that when they're already distressed about the changes that puberty are causing them. Uh, and are you able to out... Sorry. Alison, do you want to add part. anything? Uh, yeah. Um, there's been a huge increase in the number of children being referred to the Sandiford children and adolescent um, gender identity services in 2013 there were 67 referrals which was absolutely fine for the psychiatrist who's only there one day a week to cope with last year there was over 180 referrals so there is a very big increase in the amount of young people being referred and as james had said they are trying to triage to treat or to see and assess those who are approaching puberty and so they are adopting what's called a stage not age um, criteria so that if somebody is experiencing acute distress and is self-harm and suicide attempts then they will ha hopefully try to be seen quicker but unfortunately the waiting list is now a year for that and it was three months when my child first came out to me four years ago so that is increasing the distress my child came out 14 and um, she totally transitioned when she was still 14 so she was already changed her name with her passport uh, well changed her name at school but we didn't get a passport till last february when she just turned or just because she was coming up for 17. i do think it would have helped if she, we'd been able to then just follow on that whole process and get the birth certificate changed along that route if you see what i mean so then she can go forward. I mean, she is living, she's been living under her own her name for three and a half years um, since she transitioned at school. And the school were very good. They were extremely good. Um, and, but I do think it would help the, the schools as well if that is brought down. I mean, for under 16s, obviously parental consent would have to be there for that. It would be problematic if there was a young person who was in care 
or didn't have supportive parents, but then they may not have even come out to their parents if they don't have supportive parents before 16. And they wouldn't, have been, they wouldn't be able to access services on their own without parental support, really, until they were over 16. Um, sorry, I've run out of things. That's actually very helpful. Thank you, yes. Uh, can I ask about what support is there? I mean, I understand your organisation, but the, the, the broad level support, uh, is that suitable? The support that's there is, uh, at the moment, is that suitable for young people, or would some additional support require to be put in place? Um, in terms of voluntary sector support, um, Mermaids and Transparencies are doing an amazing job, but they are under-resourced in terms of lacking sort of adequate funding. Um, in terms of NHS provision, it's at the moment one day a week of a, of a child and adolescent psychiatrist trying to see the entire caseload for Scotland. Um, so it would be a very, very small drop in the ocean of, of funding for NHS to, to double that provision and bring the waiting times down to a reasonable level. Um, we, we're very much of the view that NHS funding should be put in place so that um, outpatient appointments for, for people for gender identity issues can be achieved within the 18 weeks time to treatment guarantee that everybody else's outpatient appointments receive. Uh, we don't want any special treatment, we simply want to, to be seen in the same sort of time scales as, as any other um, outpatient appointment and it would be a very small amount of, of additional capacity that would be needed to do that. And, and can I ask, on that specific issue of the outpatient appointments, have, have you made any representations? And if so, what, what response did you receive? Um, we've, we sit as part of the National Gender Identity Clinical Network for Scotland that NHS National Services run. Um, we've also made, made approaches to the Scottish Government Health Directorate um, asking for increased, increased resourcing of the gender identity clinics. Um, there tends to be, I think, a lack of recognition of just how many more cases there are now. Um, people plan their services based on, on, on 10 year ago predictions without realising that as social attitudes improve, people are more confident, they have less to lose by coming out as themselves. Um, we, we also encounter resistance in terms of people making assumptions that there aren't clinicians that would want to work in the area and that therefore there's no point in recruiting because no one would apply. We don't believe that is true and we think that, um, that there are also multidisciplinary team models that you could use where you might use more nursing uh, staff or more um, uh, counsellors and, and uh, that would enable an increase in capacity without needing to necessarily have an additional psychiatrist if psychiatrists are somehow hard to come by. Um, we don't feel that, that uh, effort, enough effort has been made to try and, and, and increase the capacity yet. Okay, and, and finally, um, can, I, can I ask what you think the risks and benefits are of lowering the, the application age to 16 and possibly even further in the future? Um, because it's a document change, it's not irreversible, it's something that enables that person to feel valued, understood, um, accepted. Um, we don't see there being a significant risk of lowering. Um, we think that there... Risks at all, James. The, the key thing is about um, making sure that people have their parental support. Um, and because we're asking for under 16s with parental consent, um, that means that it wouldn't be pitching the child and the parent against each other. It would it would be about recognising that there are young people who do have that parental support. Now, it's a very sad situation that there are still young people who don't have parental support, but they are, they are the ones who feel too scared to come out. And that's about education of, of, of uh, society. So we we think that it's it's a positive thing to reduce the age it shows that people do know their gender from a young age we we, we if you think back you sort of like kind of three age three four five you knew you were a boy or a girl and you knew to what degree that that fitted um, and uh, we think it's only going to be those cases where the parents and the young person are are convinced that this is the right thing to do and the young person is already living in that gender successfully that are going to apply for a birth certificate change and it, it just means that the paperwork can be in order and they're not being constantly outed and quizzed and have to reveal their past when they go for their first job or if they're putting in sort of like kind of for an exam uh, certificate. Okay, thank you very much indeed.
Um, John Mason, I think, would like to come in. Just to follow up, the, 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 these figures about referrals, I think, if I got it correctly, it was 67 has risen quite quickly to 180. I mean, I just wondered from international experience if you've got any kind of forecasts or, or what the need might be in the future or if we're, if we're pretty much in the dark. It's it's hard to know exactly like kind of how many people still are holding back from, from coming out. But presumably um, some. There will be some. Yeah. Society Society's attitudes towards transgender people have improved, improved hugely in the last few years, but there are, there are still a sizable number of people who are not supportive. Um, so we think it will continue to go up for a while yet. Um, I don't think there'll be the same level of dramatic rise. I think that the kind of tipping point of, of kind of social awareness of trans has has hit and and now if you take the average person in the street they know what transgender means and and they are usually supportive but occasionally not so i think that that biggest leap has happened but there will continue to be a bit of an increase from from now on and we can't really predict exactly how how much and how long but the concern would be that could mean that waiting lists got even worse yeah. than a year yes yeah. okay thanks okay um annabelle <coughs> thanks you. thanks convener um, the recent report from the Women and Equalities Committee at Westminster, it didn't focus on trans people with non-binary and non-gendered identities, but it certainly recommended the UK government um, um, should look into that aspect of the need perhaps to create a legal category for people who do not identify with either gender. And this committee is interested in exploring that area as well. And I, I just wonder if... if you could help the committee with explaining what it what it would mean to be able to identify as as gender neutral. Yeah, so at the minute, obviously, the Gender Recognition Act only allows people to change their birth certificate from male to female or vice versa. Um, but personally, I don't identify as um, either of those two things. And we're seeing increasingly in the trans community that quite a big chunk of people are saying that the labels man and woman don't fit me. And um, I even though I, I don't feel like the gender was assigned at birth, I don't want to switch to what might be considered the opposite one. Um, so we're sort of left in a position where lots of that community might be out to their friends, sort of have people who know them, know how they identify. <coughs> but when it then comes to maybe going out with their friends later to the pub and they have to pull out their ID, it's, it's only got man or woman on it. And that sort of undermines that sense of who you are. Um, and what we would be asking for is basically kind of the ability to opt out of having either that M or F on all of all of our official documents and instead to have, I mean, for example, passports use an X marker rather than an M or an F, which is something that's already done in Australia and New Zealand, um, and also to have something similar on birth certificates just so that you don't have this sort of legal marker that kind of undermines that sense of who you actually are. That's very helpful and, you know, I can understand the both the logic and the personal sentiment behind that. But are there any um, potential risks in adding a gender-neutral option to um, legal documents such as birth certificates or, or passports? Well, there certainly aren't any risks in particular to adding them to passports. Passports have been able to have gender-neutral markers for decades and decades now. Um, it's widely accepted by the International Aviation Office. Um, and although I think there are a few countries that won't let people in with gender-neutral markers, that would obviously be the choice of an individual if they would rather have a gender-neutral passport and limited travel options rather than one in a binary gender and we're, we're able to travel everywhere. Um, also, there are already um, two countries in the world, Malta and Argentina, that allow people to be recognised as a non-binary gender on their birth certificates. Um, those are, again, recent pieces of legislation, but they're the two pieces that are considered to be the kind of absolute international gold standard on it, because they do include non-binary genders. Um, there's no reason why it needs to cause any problems, realistically. All it is is about making sure that there's not a group of society that's got this kind of yeah, letter hanging over them that marks them out as something that isn't really true for them. Um, and it just means that all trans people have the same access to that recognition that trans men and trans women currently have. Thank you very much. James, are you wanting to... Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, sometimes people think um, allowing recognition of non-binary people might cause problems for fertility or uh, parental 
law. Um, but actually what you see is that there's already trans people in various diverse situations that aren't that readily accounted for by fertility and parental legislation anyway. So it wouldn't actually make the the issues around around th those areas any any more complex because the lived reality of people is already just as complex. It, it it's uh, it's about just the law recognising the diversity of of trans people, and and uh, we we have our families and we we have our relationships and we seek fertility treatment already as as non-binary people or as trans men and trans women with our with our birth certificates not necessarily um, easily reflecting sort of how our how our bodies are and and so I don't think that that makes it any more difficult it's it just recognizes the reality of people's lives I'll follow that up in a yeah. moment James I think Alison's one it's slightly related but it actually came to me that um for the very small amount of children who are born intersex with maybe ambiguous genitalia it might be advantageous then for parents to have that ability to then register their child at birth as an ex, if because of course current think it used to be thinking that because some intersex people are trans too, and so it used to be that they would decide whether the child was male or female, and then they would be brought up like that and maybe have surgery early. But of course current thinking is now is not to do any surgery at all, and allow the child to grow up to express whichever gender or not that they are. So that, sorry, it was just I suddenly thought about that, that that would also be useful. Oh, sorry, Jean. I, I just want to point out um, that because being born with an intersex body is different from having, uh, from being transgender and, and having a gender identity that varies from what people's expectations might be, that um, we take the position that um, all decisions around intersex should be taken by intersex people and their, and their um, act activists. So we are in consultation and discussions with, with intersex people to make sure that they aren't left out or, or, or ignored. Um, we, we've heard from them, but we think that the committee sort of should look at intersex issues in its own right. I've heard from them that they, they, they do have some concerns about registering an ex at birth. Um, they worry that um, if you if you applied an ex on an intersex child's birth certificate at birth, it might encourage parents to seek surgical interventions to make that child's uh, sex more clear. Um, the, the the intersex organisations such as Intersex UK have said that. They would welcome an X that people can opt into later, um, but sort of for an intersex baby to be registered as M or F, but for no um, in irreversible treatment such as surgery to be carried out to to force their body to conform to that M or F. And where are such identification to to be possible, and the law would <coughs> change to to achieve that? I mean, just thinking this through, does that create issues? For example. Um, in the unfortunate event that someone were the subject of a conviction before a criminal court with a custodial sentence pending. How is that dealt with, James, in terms of an appropriate um, okay. custodial facility? We've, we've worked for several years now with the Scottish Prison Service in partnership with them very successfully. Um, they take a self-declaration approach. Um, if somebody identifies and lives as female, then they would uh, treat them as a female in the custodial process, um, do individualised risk assessment to place them and supervise them appropriately within the female estate. If somebody identifies as non-binary, then they look at their individual circumstances and they recognise they've only got male and female estates, but they look at their cir circumstances in a holistic way, work with that person and identify which of those two options is the closer fit. So they already respond to non-binary people within custodial system and uh, that works quite smoothly. Um, having having X on their birth certificate um, would, would not make that any more complex. It's, it's about looking at that individual and saying, okay, well, for the limited options that we have, how can we best meet your needs? And I was going to ask the same question in the context of hospitalisation, yeah. James. Presumably some arrangement currently exists yeah. Yeah, hospital treatment is a bit easier because there's usually actually are sort of like kind of single rooms if somebody would be a lot more comfortable in one of those. Um, but also, it, <coughs> sorry, um, in hospital, it's about upholding someone's privacy and dignity. 
um, working with them in a person-centred way. And again, sort of like kind of large large health boards such as Greater Glasgow and Clyde have policies that are non-binary and inclusive and uphold people's uh, right to dignity and privacy. And, and it's, it works it works relatively smoothly as long as as long as the 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 clinicians are are willing to to follow their own policy and know it exists. Um, so it's only when people are trying to be discriminatory that these sorts of things fall down. And the more that people have legal recognition and protection, the better those those processes operate because it's no longer seen as as an option, but but a, a requirement to treat someone with dignity. That's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I've got three people that want to come in: John Mason, John Finney. Christian and I don't know Sandra as well. Yep. So can we go with John? Thanks. Mason it was first? really following on from uh, what okay? Annabelle no. Gold has been asking. I've just been thinking. I mean, if if somebody uh, has the gender neutral option, where does that leave them for sport? Are they then excluded because sport tends to be quite rigid on, on the male female thing? Okay. In in terms of sport, um, the officiating bodies are much more interested in your physiology mm. than your gender identity. Yeah. So they, they have rules about the level of testosterone you can have circulating in your body in order to be able to classify as, as, as female for, for participation purposes. Um, so we already have some non-binary people who um, participate in sport. Uh, they generally tend to continue to participate in their birth gender um, or they, they sometimes opt to go into a sport which is less gendered because that feels more comfortable to them. So having legal recognition um, would still allow sporting bodies to set their rules about what physiology someone needs to have to ensure safe and fair participation in a, in a gendered sport. That's, that's helpful, thanks. <clears throat> okay, um, I think Sandra? No, to find what they're okay to put out. Thank you very much. It was just coming on the back of Annabelle's questions in regards to the NHS and prisons, etc. Now, obviously, the committee that uh, reported back from Westminster, the Women's Equality Committee from Westminster, mentioned there was problems in the NHS, uh, difficulties w with uh, people being treated there, and also we saw the two deaths of transgender people in the prison. Now, obviously, that has devolved to, to Scotland. Uh, and you gave a very good explanation of what the, you know, the health board does in the prison service also. Do you see or has there been difficulties in relation to you know, what I've just said about what's happened down in England and Scotland as well? Yeah, there is three key dif difficulties I'd want to flag up. The first we've already touched on, which is about capacity of the gender identity clinics to see people in a timely manner. Um, that's That's been historic under-resourcing. It would not require more than a couple of clinicians or time um, to, to make the massive difference in those waiting times and bring them to 18 weeks. Um, the second one is around our concerns about some of the assessment questions so it's kind of we would much rather that people focused in on on whether someone has realistic expectations of what can be achieved by a sur surgery for example how well have they thought through the consequences of that decision rather than what toys did they play with as a child because we don't think that what toys you play with a child is a very good way of deciding if you will or will not benefit from genital surgery um, and then the third one is around GPs um, what we've increasingly seen is that as GPs have um, had tensions around their contract terms, they have seem to be starting to use um, monitoring hormones and providing hormone prescriptions for trans people as, as one of those political footballs that they can flex their muscles around. And we think that a strong approach needs to be taken to reaffirm that GPs must provide hormone prescriptions and monitoring for trans people and can't say that's out with their general GP remit. Sorry, I, I didn't yeah. mean to interrupt Sorry. you there, but what I was referring mm -hmm. to was, you know, general practice, general services in the NHS. Ah. In that respect, it was following on from Annabelle's Sorry. question in, in regards to that. And the report had mentioned yeah. that uh, basically they, they seemed to think there was discrimination against transgender people when they're accessing, you know, yeah. ordinary general services. Uh, and I just wondered if you came across that in Scotland, similar to what the report has mentioned in England, and also uh, the prison service where the two people yeah. obviously tragically died. Yeah. Have we seen anything like that in Scotland at all? Is there any evidence that shows that it's... Okay. To take the prison service first, 
Um, we're very pleased the Scottish Prison Service does have a more progressive, humane policy than, than the English Prison Service does around trans people and therefore places them in the gender that they, uh, gender the state they identify as, even if their paperwork isn't yet in order. Um, so we, we have, that's not to say that the Prison Service in Scotland does everything perfectly and there are still discriminatory attitudes among, among prison staff and, and difficulties in terms of, of making sure that people aren't misgendered while they're in that, that state. Um, in terms of the NHS, um, yes, there are still problems around discrimination by practitioners. Um, I myself have experienced, and, and so have many people, that change in the way that people is in, are interacting with you when they realise that you're trans, and, and that uh, just that, that, that change in, in the level of, of care and, and concern and more of a kind of, well, is this your own fault for having decided to transition, um, maybe maybe you've kind of harmed your health and it's your it's your own fault. Um, people sort of outing, clinicians outing trans people to other clinicians and not uh, respecting people's privacy, um, misgendering them, um, and uh, sometimes outright refusal of care. So one of the things that sometimes comes back is particularly around mental health service provision. So say you're depressed after a a, a bereavement, um, or you've you've uh, got some some sort of social anxiety that you're wanting some cognitive behavioural therapy for. You might we we have increased we have recognised that uh, people sometimes get refused by their community mental health care provider, um, but saying oh you're too complicated because you're trans, or well you're trans so the gender identity clinic should be dealing with all your mental health needs and it's a well no actually the gender identity clinic is only about your gender reassignment. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you yeah, again. Sorry. I know there's others want to mm -hmm. do we have any hard evidence data in regards to what you're um, saying? We we do have some statistics from surveys we've done. I don't have the exact figures with me today but Thank I'm you. happy to send them to the, the, the committee afterwards. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, over to you again Annabelle. Thank so, you um, so convener. Hard. I just wondered what um, engagement you've had with the Scottish Government about your campaign um, for the changes you seek um, to the Gender Recognition Act and, and whether your contact was before or after this recent report from the Women and Equalities Committee. Okay, we've, we've been engaging with the Scottish Government um, for over a year now around the, the gen gender recognition reforms we're seeking that's continued through the, the report of the, of, from, from the UK Parliament. We are very clear that uh, gender recognition is, is devolved batter. It relates to birth certificates, which are um, devolved. Um, and uh, we think that um, legislating at Scotland would provide us the best opportunity to get the law right. Um, it was passed by a SEAL motion sort of, uh, previously in 2004. We think that a tandem approach, with uh, ideally with the UK Parliament legislating for England and Welsh birth certificates and Scotland for Scottish birth certificates, um, similar to how equal marriage was progressed by the two parliaments, would enable us to make sure that the legislation is right for Scotland and, uh, and, and maximises the, the, the potential to, to achieve, achieve all the good practice that we, we desire. Would your ideal, James, be to see the same changes both north and south of the border? Um, we think that uh, it might end up being that Scotland has better legislation. So, for example, if you if you look at marriage law, for example, um, there are more restrictions on whether 16 and 17 year olds can marry down in England um, than there is in Scotland. And we think likewise we could end up with more progressive legislation in, in Scotland. Um, there's already differences in, in some of the aspects around how gender recognition works in Scotland versus England. Um, so, for example, there's a slightly obscure um, way that you can, you can get gender recognition if you've been transitioned for many years and were prevented from getting gender recognition initially because you were still married before equal marriage. Um, and in, in Scotland, there's less uh, onerous uh, requirements for, for evidencing that than there are in England. So you wouldn't see any particular difficulties if the um, laws were slightly different? Um, I think that there's so many things where the laws are slightly different in Scotland and England that people are very used to that and I don't think it would cause a problem. I think it would just mean that, that we would get the right law for Scotland. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank you, Annabel. Um, Christian? 
Over to you. Thank you very much. Yes, and um, I would agree with you, James. And on that particular point, uh, I would ask: Will you try to change the law in Scotland first, being likely to be more progressive, to give a good example for the rest of the UK? Would it be one of the intention? Yes, I think that um, I think that in two thousand and four, the original act was written quite defensively to try and get it through the House of Lords, and there were some very unpleasant statements made in the House of Lords about about the bill back then. Um, I think that Scottish Parliament, um, by its its design, is is easier to engage with by by trans people, um, and uh, considers legislation in a slightly different way from from the the two house ma manner in, in in Westminster. So I think that Scotland should lead the way, and it should um, put down that blueprint, and then I think that will make it a lot easier for for the government uh, down in, in England to to legislate for England and Wales and get that successfully through the House of Lords. That's I should declare I was not a member of the House of Lords <laughs> at that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I have still some reserved issue. Uh, and of course, the Equality Act 2010. Uh, what changes do you want? Do you want uh, ch changing to be gender identity more than uh, gender reassignment? You, you talked about that already. And what about the exemption on employment as well? I didn't realize uh, that there could be exemption on employment. Can you talk us more yep. about that? Yeah, we were really pleased that uh, the Women and Equalities Committee recommended changes to the Equality Act. Uh, and that's something we've been calling for for a long time, but we've been directing to Westminster rather than Scotland because it's a reserved matter. Um, we would like to see the protected characteristic be defined as, as gender identity rather than gender reassignment to make it clear that it includes all trans people, not just those who um, undergo a, a more medicalised transition from male to female or from female to male. Um, we would also like to see the removal of the exceptions that currently exist. So, at the moment, um, an employer that provides that an employer that only hires women, for example, can refuse to hire a trans woman, even even if she's been many many years transitioned. Um, we think that that's uh, not appropriate, and we're really pleased that uh, in terms of of women's equality organisations and, and uh, violence against women's services in Scotland, um, they've been very trans friendly and um, as far as we're aware, none of them have, have used that possible exemption and they do have trans women employed within within uh, women only posts there. Um, but down in England, they, they are sometimes using that exception and we think that that's wrong and unfair. Yeah, I wanted to be further. I, I was a bit surprised by by, by, by some uh, some of, you, of of your evidence this morning. Uh, we seems to want to go into a binary system to a system of free, add, adding the X to it. Is it not uh, another constraint? Is that it will be as constrained instead of two gender? We ended up with three. Is there not a view somewhere? And you, you talked about, and we, I think, I'm, I think the parliament would want to hear from them, uh, from the intersex, uh, uh, intersex uh, co community, to know is really the right way to go about it. Okay, um, you can make an argument that we should simply degender documents. So, for example, we don't have legal um, ethni ethnicities uh, recorded on our on our documents, um, but we still do um, minority um, ethnic uh, um, equality work by by monitoring and diversity forms people's people's race. Um, likewise, we don't have a legal sexual orientation recorded on our on our documents, but we still do sexual orientation equality. So, a case can be made that you don't need to have a legal gender, um, and indeed, sort of. That the law, that the government should maybe not be involved in, in in legislating people's gender, and we think that that's something that would take a lot more discussion and, and consideration by by society. I don't think that society is in that place at the moment, um, and indeed, trans people like myself. So as I'm, I'm a trans man who transitioned from female to male, it took me a lot of effort um, to get my my document saying male, and it helps to ensure that people respect my gender identity. So there are trans people who wouldn't want to have a, a non-binary passport, for example, because they might feel that they would be more vulnerable to, to discrimination if they couldn't show that they were legally recognised as men or women. Um, I think that uh, the more that we can move to a system where gender is not uh, made a kind of required answer, the better. So, so many forms at the moment, you can't get past the, that stage on the online application unless you tick male or female, and it's often not remotely relevant. 
Um, but we think that uh, for the time being, allowing people to opt out of being classified as M or F, but not forcing people to um, not be classified as M or F is, is the way forward. Allow it to be optional. So it's not about creating a third gender category. It's about creating a space where people don't need to have a gender category, if you see what I mean. Um, it's a subtle but important difference. You still not convince me, Jen. <laughs> I, I would love to hear from, from the other panel as well of that idea that society should become less and less ba binary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, or having an X, you know, we think about new schools, for example, when uh, facilities are not female and, 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 uh, and male anymore. I, we wouldn't want them to add another door <laughs> saying X, for, for example. We wouldn't dream of that. So, I, is there not a time for, I know society, you said society is maybe not ready for it, but if we want to change society on, 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 on that particular topic, is there not a time to maybe uh, add <coughs> that as a fourth point to see how Scotland could become a, a non, you know, not insisting so much upon gender, not only on paperwork, mm -hmm. but as well on employment and as well on schools and how we, we define ourselves. Members yeah. of the panel will remember to take a look at that? Certainly with schools, um, you see increasingly schools trying to avoid gender stereotypes for their pupils, um, trying to, to make sure that every pupil knows that they can be who they are and achieve whatever their ambitions are, and that they doesn't have to be restricted by their gender, and we wholeheartedly support that um, work. And... Um, what we also see increasingly within sort of like kind of a public toilet provision and, and things is, is a move towards um, kind of more single cubicles and not not uh, requiring people to to go through an M or an F door. Um, I, I remember going to to a, a a service provider and there was all these individual cubicles and they'd alternately labelled them M F M F and it was just like well why can't these just be labelled toilets? They're they're individual fully contained toilets nobody's sharing with anybody. So I think that is increasingly what people are moving to and uh, people are less hung up about gender now than they used to be but it's, it's, a, it's a process and I think uh, there's, there's so many instinctive assumptions we make about gender still that, that it can be quite challenging for, for some people to, to, to realise that actually gender is, is, is a lot more diverse and a lot, a lot more complex than just a binary. I think Vic would like to come in. Yeah, and I think just it's important that at the minute when the reality is that we live in such a binary society, that it's important that right now there are changes that people that don't identify in either of those binary ways are included. So to give an example, when I moved back to Edinburgh and tried to set up my bills, I had to pick a title um, in order to sign up with British Gas. They're all gendered. If I didn't pick a title, British Gas assumes that I'm a business, so can't provide me with energy. So I have to pick one or the other. So I've reached the point where I've just started arbitrarily picking titles just out of the list somewhere, because realistically, none of them are my title. None of them do describe who I am. So although I think there's a lot of value in looking at where we can break down binaries in terms of facilities and things like titles, I think for right now, though, whilst people are having to navigate these spaces that are so one or the other, it's really important that we do create additional space for people that don't identify in that way to be able to access things and to not not have the very first thing they do be sort of, oh, which way should I lie a little bit today? Because that is kind of the reality of it at the moment. Well, you, well, you see the point. You're just adding a third one, which may be not going to be the answer for some people or will be difficult to... to to navigate in between the three, why not re re removing them all? I think that you could remove them all definitely from some things, but I don't know that we would necessarily consider it to be kind of a third option though, because it wouldn't. I wouldn't consider it to be a third gender. It's more, it would more just be the category that describes all people whose gender is not male or female, because at the minute the way we gender everything is one way or the other. So it, it's not so much that it's your third option and everyone in that option is the same. It's more just that at the minute we organise everything with two options. Those two options don't fit everyone. So actually we need to make sure that people aren't pushed into just one of those two for right now. My, my point is, what, what, you know, that kind of legislation you, you want to bring is going to reaffirm the idea that you have to make a choice. And, and, and does parents think that it's a, the right way about it to, to having people to make a choice of all gender, whatever it is, F, M or X? Or do you think we should have a space to make sure that you don't need to define that gender? 
would it be easier for, for the life of parents? I think, as James said earlier on, um, it's a difficult question as a parent. I think to being led by your child, I think, would be the one I would say. So let the child define their gender because there are still some young children, even sort of under 14, who are still coming out as non-binary. Uh, I need to think about that one. James, what you come in then, Vic? Yeah, I just wanted to re-clarify that um, what we're asking for is the option to opt out of that binary, to say, I don't want to have a legal gender, I just want to be a human being. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be a kind of optional rather than blanket enforced degendering for, for those who feel that the two current options don't fit them. So it's not about saying there's male, female, or a third like kind of legal gender. It's saying there's male, female legal genders, and then there's the option of not being legally gendered. Um, that's that's what we're so. What you would probably say is ultimately you'd want everybody to pick that. Don't don't legally gender me. Um, I think the majority of people are comfortable with having a legal gender. Um, I think that there's no need to sort of immediately remove gender off, off, off everybody um, legally. I think that it's simply about allowing those people where those two options don't fit to be able to opt out of that and say, well, simply, I'm simply a human being. I don't need to have a legal gender of male or female. I can simply live my life as me, as a human being. Vic, do you want to come in? Yeah, and I think just to say as well that obviously if, if you're not trans, people accept your gender because it matches and it's easy and it's probably something you never need to think about. So therefore, probably the concept of removing legal gender seems much easier because you're not going to then be challenged, you're not going to have someone <coughs> use that as a reason to undermine your identity. Whereas realistically, if you're a trans person, there's... it there's much more value in having documents that reflect who you are. So I think, yes, although in some ways moving beyond kind of having gender recorded at all would be really valuable for right now, it's more important, I think, to make sure that trans people have, that, you know, they have passports, they have birth certificates that say, this is who I am and, and the government recognises me that way. C can I ask you, Vic, how do you feel when you were saying you had to pick a uh, male or a female how does that actually make you feel personally when you've got to go through this process and what difference would it make if you had the third option? Um, I think that, I mean, it's mostly one of annoyance and also I'm not really sure what to put because I don't know, for example, if it's important for them to know what my gender is and I can't tell them what my gender is, then I'm not sure which one to pick that gives them the information that they need. Um, so a good example would be probably that I haven't been... I've lived in back in Edinburgh now for almost a year and I haven't registered with a GP because all GPs ask you for your gender and only provide those two options. And I'm not really sure what it is that they're asking me for. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of toyed with the idea of just drawing a third box and taking that one. Um, but it's just that sense immediately because it's often the first question that's asked of you um, that this service isn't for me um, almost just immediately. Well, the, these, you know, this service probably doesn't know that people like me exist, and and even if it does, it, it didn't care enough to put a third box on a form. So it's just that sense of, well, I probably I probably won't go there then, or, or use their their things. So. Yeah. so if you then did have to use that service, you would then have to go and explain to the GP that you don't fit this. Yeah, absolutely. And as I said, with titles now, I've just often. Um, so with my bills in the end, I decided to go for Mr. And every time I have to speak to someone on the phone about my bills, they go to me. It says Mr. Valentine here. Is is that a mistake? Do you want me to change that? Because people hear my voice mm -hmm. on the phone and assume that I'm not a Mr. And I'm just like, no, nope, no, nope, that's fine. Like, oh, OK, Mr. Valentine. And you just get those kinds of yeah. quite strange interactions where people aren't entirely sure why you've given certain types of information. Uh, but the thing is, is that they're not giving me the option to actually tell them what the answer is. Mm -hmm. um, so... And that's the thing, it's not like we don't exist until you put our identities on forms. We're already using all of the same services as everybody else. People are already working with us and helping us. It's just that services aren't aware enough to kind of provide things in an inclusive way, um, which they should be doing. Yeah. Has, have you found out at all, is there any large employers or any organisations that give you the option, say in an application form, to use a third option? 
Well, there are quite... There are, I mean, for example, now on driving licences, you can get gender neutral titles and also most bank accounts um, will allow you. So my bank card has the gender neutral title MX on it. Mm -hmm. um, so that it is becoming much more common and it's actually often becoming much more common in the private sector. There's kind of an entire project set up by non-binary people to basically spam private sectors that don't have gender neutral titles neutral title fields etc um and sort of say to them you know add this or everyone's going to stop using your services etc mm -hmm. um and there are definitely kind of good practice there is good practice out there particularly for lgbt services that are more used to working mm -hmm. with non-binary people who will do things like ask more inclusive questions about gender identity they'll also ask you about what pronouns you want to use on forms so that it avoids sort of having to guess what <laughs> pronouns someone might use um but yeah, it's something that needs to be worked on. Yeah, thank you. James, do you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to add that like the Law Society of Scotland has moved to, to allow sort of its solicitors to um, be gender neutral. Um, that was in part because uh, one of their one of their training solicitors is uh, openly non binary. Mm -hmm. um, so it's I think when people realise that non binary people exist and that they are there and, and this just makes things easier and clearer so that it's no longer a distorted bit of information that you're getting. It's it's actually reflects their lived reality, mm -hmm. um, than than even sort of organisations you might traditionally might think of as relatively traditional and 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 uh, will 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 often move and and be and be able to accommodate this this quite easily. It's it's not that hard. It just mm -hmm. requires that uh, will. Yeah, thank you. I think Sandra wants to come in. Uh, I suppose it's a small question, but I think it's very far-reaching, uh, and it's to Vic. You've obviously experienced, uh, you know, instances, problems, etc., in li living a life of uh, you know, non-binary. I just wanted to put this in the mix. When you have cultural, religious differences, how difficult would that be, uh, you know, for for yourself and others? Um, I think it's kind of difficult to say in a generalised way um, because obviously individual members of different cultures and religions are going to respond to you differently. And I also think that actually it's really important to kind of emphasise the fact that binary um, separations of gender are very much a kind of Western Christian phenomenon. Um, so it's actually probably our societies that are the most divided um, in that way about gender. Um, and I don't necessarily know why non i don't necessarily know why non-binary identities would be i mean would be more of an issue in terms of engaging with people of faith than kind of anything else to do with the lgbt spectrum is and i think it's, it's just something you have to take on a case-by-case -case basis the point the, the point i wanted to raise was uh, you know james had mentioned the fact that you know transgender there are obviously we know cultural some religions that won't allow a man you know, to treat a woman, etc., etc. Uh, and I was interested when you said you, you got your bills addressed to Mister uh, rather than MS, Miss, or whatever it may be. Uh, you know, I just wondered about that also. But the difficulty that, that would cause, not just for yourself and others, but obviously the, the, the cultural differences, uh, you know, and religious differences uh, for people who didn't want a certain sex to treat them. Or you know, how would you go over that? Non-binary. James. Would you see that as discrimination for yourself and others, or James, do you want yeah. to mm -hmm. I think it's about recognising that there are a wide range of reasons that a service user might want a particular service delivered in a particular way, and uh, that that's not purely simply just about gender. There can be all kinds of of other factors that people would like taken into account in the, in order to give them the person-centred care that they would need, um, and I think that. Um, provision of of services where somebody is trans, th those can be those can be accommodated and already are because they're the fact that Vic can't get documents that reflect their gender doesn't mean that Vic might not necessarily be in a service provision role anyway. Um, all it, all that uh, allowing legal recognition does is allows that person's identity to actually be reflected on their documents, makes it kind of clearer who they are. In, and enables a, a service provider to assign their staff more appropriately, not less. Um, it's it's not it's not something that needs to be in competition. It it can be something that uh, where we respect everybody's different mm -hmm. views 
and uh, make sure that the staff allocation reflects the needs of service users. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Jill. Thank you very much. Do any of the witnesses have anything else they'd like to say that you've not had the opportunity to put forward? Alison, would anything you would like to say? I do think that, yes, the if you did adopt the self-declaration that it should be available for 16 to 17 year olds and also with parental consent for under 16s. Okay, thank you. James, is there anything you would like to say? Just thank you again for taking this evidence session. I know we've covered a lot of diverse issues, um, some of which can be legislated on and some of which are more about the practice within the NHS or, or other public services. Um, if you have any further questions or points you want to clarify, we're very happy to um, send, send written submissions as well. Okay, thanks. Vic, and you would like to say? Yeah, yeah, just to reiterate James's sentiments and say kind of thanks for hearing our evidence today. Okay, thank you. And I'm assuming none of the committee members have any other questions you would like to ask? No? Okay. Well, can I again thank the, the witnesses for your contribution? And that concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will take place on Thursday, the 11th of February, and I will now suspend the meeting for the committee to move into private session. Thank you. <laughs>